amount of water possible. The desert and the Everglades. We'll take a look at these two diverse areas of the United States and we'll see the fascinating array of wildlife that's made a home in each today when Discovery takes a first-hand look at nature's adaptations. Discovery 69, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen. Brady. Mr. Brady, we'd like to do a research study of your typically American family. Uh, look, I'm a little jammed up right now. At first, Mr. Brady was reluctant. But as his wife, too, had reservations. No chance, man. And their housekeeper termed our idea... Hilarious. We observed moments of honest communication. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Their concern for proper discipline. Well, maybe we ought to hang them up and beat them. The play patterns of the children. We found warmth. Oh, I absolutely love you. And sympathy. I'm sorry. I, I'm really very sorry. Oh, darned onions. And concern for one another. <laughs> Our conclusion, the Brady Bunch is a very happy family. Welcome to Discovery. Today we've come to the Everglades of Southern Florida, to the river of grass that flows from Lake Okeechobee, north of where we are, south to the Florida Keys. We're here in Everglades National Park, a million and a half acre preserve of sawgrass, swamp, and sloughs like this one that's been set aside out of the seven million acres that make up the entire Everglades region. There isn't another area like this in all the world. For much of the year, as far as the eye can see, much of the Everglades is covered by sawgrass and shallow water, rarely more than two feet deep. In the lower areas, sloughs, spelled S-L-O-U-G-H-S, -S, have formed. The sloughs are small ponds, such as this one. During the drier winter and spring periods, when the water level of the Everglades is low, more and more of the animal life moves into the sloughs, where food is plentiful, and the life cycle can be maintained. It's thought that the Indians of this area, the Seminoles and Miccosukees, first called the Everglades Paheoki, which means grassy water. And you can see why. In some places, the grass is so thick and the water so shallow that only an airboat can make its way through the stubby growth. Everglades National Park is the third largest of all of our national parks and was created to preserve the ecology, the delicate balance of climate, terrain, plant, and animal life that makes up this area. Over 300 varieties of birds alone have been seen in the park, including the most varied assortment of wading birds to be seen anywhere in the United States. These birds are especially well adapted to the shallow water flats that cover so much of the area. One of the best known of the Everglades birds is the Anhinga. The Anhinga, or water turkey as it's known locally, spends most of its time along the sloughs or canals looking for fish. It has an unusually long and agile snake-like neck and a long pointed beak. 
The entire arrangement is ideally suited for catching its food, like small bream and garfish that are found throughout the Everglades. Unlike some of the wading birds that stalk their prey on foot, the anhinga usually swims after its food. Instead of scooping the fish up, it spears the fish with the end of its beak, throwing it up into the air, and then catching it in its beak. Other birds in the long march of evolution have developed other adaptations. The purple gallinule is a beautiful purple and green bird with bright yellow legs and a yellow beak tipped in red. It hunts for food in the marshier areas. And since its legs are shorter than most of the wading birds, it makes its way across the marsh by walking on top of the lily pads, using the delicate green pads as stepping stones. Where another bird might fall through, the large flat claws of the gallinule provide a perfect base for standing on the broad leaves. Another unusual bird of the Florida Everglades is the roseate spoonbill, a large pink bird with a flattened spoonbill. Like the other wading birds, it has long, thin legs for standing or walking in the shallow water. But unlike most of the others that have sharp, long beaks for catching fish, the spoonbill eats by swinging its bill from side to side just below the surface of the water, scooping in thousands of tiny marine organisms like a marine vacuum cleaner. Here, the spoonbill spends its days along with other water birds like the white ibis, the blue heron, and the familiar pelican that uses its beak as a sort of shovel to scoop up the fish it feeds upon. There's an abundance of other life in the Everglades, mammals like cougar, an otter, reptiles like snakes and lizards, and a huge variety of fish and amphibians that live in the sloughs and canals. The largest creature in the park, and one which only a few years ago was perilously close to becoming extinct, is the alligator. The alligator is found only in the southeastern United States, and primarily in Florida. Zoologists believe that the alligator lived as long as 200 million years ago and is one of the few living links with the prehistoric past. The Spanish explorers who came to Florida more than 300 years ago were the first white men to see this distinctly American creature. And they called him El Lagarto, the lizard. Later, settlers picked up the term, mispronounced it, and the word alligator has been with us ever since. Conservationists estimate that there were once three million alligators in Florida alone. Because of the value of their hides, they were hunted ruthlessly, and now only about one-tenth of that number remain. They might have disappeared completely had not laws been passed protecting the dwindling number that were left. Survival of the alligator, and for that matter, most of the other life of the Everglades, depends upon an abundant supply of water, either the fresh water that moves down from Lake Okeechobee or the salt water that washes in from the surrounding sea. In many areas, the two mingle, forming a brackish kind of water that's not as salty as the ocean, but isn't quite fresh water either. In these waters, life develops and life goes on. The food chain, the key to survival, depends upon this water. If it weren't here, if there were a severe drought, if the waters were to disappear, much of the life as we know it here would also vanish. But what about an area where there's very little water, where months go by with no rainfall at all, where the sun beats down relentlessly and the land is parched and dry? There, survival takes on a different form. We'll travel to the Sonoran Desert of the southwestern United States, where we'll see a different kind of ecology, including an animal that apparently drinks no water at all. And we'll do that in just a minute.
settle down? Not a chance. Not when you're on the road with the Partridge family. Traveling free and easy. Gotta get on. There's this guy I want you to lean on. His name is Danny Partridge. We got a message for you, Partridge. You're squeezing my duck, sir. Well, if you must know, I have a date. With a guy? You're kidding. What did you do? Oh, the usual things one does on a date. You're kidding. Spend some time with Shirley Jones and the Partridge family every week on ABC. Traveling free and easy. This is the desert of southern Arizona. Here, too, there's an abundance of life, but it's much less readily seen than the wildlife of the Everglades. This is a parched, dry land with daytime temperatures that frequently go well above 100 degrees, with rainfall that averages less than 10 inches a year, and with wide open spaces without too many places to hide from predators. Here, survival depends upon a different set of adaptations than those of the Everglades. Each living thing, both plant and animal, must learn to survive with a minimum of water. Here, animals must spend much of their day in burrows beneath the ground to escape the fierce desert heat, to conserve as much moisture as possible, and to hide from natural enemies in the continuing cycle of life. And for those who do emerge during the day, protective coloration the ability to blend in with the texture and color of the terrain can also mean the difference between the survival or the disappearance of a species. One of the best examples of adaptation to desert living is the kangaroo rat, which can go through a lifetime without apparently drinking any water at all. The key to the kangaroo rat's survival is its ability to manufacture water within its body from the dry seeds that make up the bulk of its diet. Like most desert animals, the kangaroo rat is primarily nocturnal. It sleeps in an underground burrow during the day and comes out to hunt for food at night. All mammals are able to derive some moisture from the foods they eat, but the kangaroo rat is able to do this to a far greater degree and much more effectively than any other creature on Earth. Another factor in the kangaroo rat's ability to survive is its highly developed kidneys, which work so efficiently that a maximum amount of pure water is retained for use within the body and the smallest possible amount of waste is eliminated. Not only does the kangaroo rat escape predators like large birds or snakes, but even more important, by staying underground during the heat of the day in a relatively cool and humid burrow, it keeps the evaporation of its own body moisture to a minimum. There are many other forms of life in the desert, lizards like the Gila monster, insects like the scorpion, snakes like the desert boa, the banded sand snake, and the Sidewinder, with its own peculiar adaptation for moving across loose desert sand. By protective coloration and by burrowing to escape the heat, all have adapted to desert sun and terrain. One of nature's best adaptations in the reptile world, and one which almost rivals that of the kangaroo rat in the mammal world, is the fringe-toed lizard. A small reptile about six inches long has learned to survive in the very hottest parts of the desert, where surface temperatures frequently reach 190 degrees. The fringe-toed lizard has a number of adaptations that make him ideally suited to his arid world. In the first place, he's well camouflaged to match the sand, making him hard to see even by low-flying eagles or turkey buzzards. He has smooth scales and a flattened body, facilitating movement through the sand. 
and the elongated fringe scales on his toes give him exceptional traction in the sand. He can reach speeds of up to 15 miles per hour. Another adaptation that has made survival possible for the fringe-toed lizard is his ability to bury himself quickly and completely, either in the presence of danger or just to stay out of the sun. Birds, too, have made their adaptations to the hard life of the desert. Some, like the screech owl, depend on excellent natural camouflage, blending in closely with the surrounding tree trunks. And like most owls, they are nocturnal animals, sleeping during the day and venturing forth only in the cool and protective shadows of the night. There's one owl of the desert, though, that lives neither in trees nor saguaros, and which goes about much of its activity during the day. This is the burrowing owl, which has adapted to the desert by living in the underground holes made by ground squirrels or prairie dogs. The bird that's probably most closely associated with our southwestern deserts is the roadrunner, the state bird of Arizona. It gets its name from the fact that it rarely flies, but moves about by walking swiftly across the desert terrain, seeking out insects, worms, or fallen cactus fruit. During the long course of its development, the roadrunner has made an unusual adaptation to its environment. Unlike most birds, which have three toes in front and one in back, the roadrunner has opposing toes, two in front and two in back, which enable it to move quickly and surely over the broken, rocky surface that makes up much of the American desert. The desert, seemingly barren at first glance, yet filled with all kinds of plant and animal life that has adapted to burning sun and arid land. What happens when nature seems to reverse itself? When the Everglades go through a dry period? Or when the desert has a torrential rain? We'll take a look at how an alligator can help preserve the wildlife of the Everglades, and how certain toads must wait for a desert rain to reproduce. And we'll do that in just a minute. Ideal launches the photorific shock bank. Racing boats that change course by themselves because they're equipped with computer pilot systems. Plug in a pilot disc and your shark will steer the course you want automatically. You get four different pilot discs for four different maneuvers. Cruise them. Race them. They're a wild breed. The photorific shark pack. They're ideal. I've been in a fight or two in my life, but my biggest one wasn't in pictures. It was against cancer. I won that one too, but you, you know, you can't win if you don't know what you're fighting. And I knew because I'd had a checkup. Give yourself a fighting chance, get a checkup. And while you're at it, send a check to the American Cancer Society too. It's great to be alive. in a while you run across a household where the father is a autistic, high-strung grouch. Why, I'm so hard to get along with? No, 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 easy, very easy. There are some things that only a father should teach his daughter. And who teaches her to drive? Her father. Right. You didn't hear it from me. In order to teach, a person needs tact, delicacy, sensitivity. It's a good thing I'm a patient man. Like I said, talented, artistic, high strung. You always get that historic when you get fired? Danny Thomas, starring in Make Room for Granddaddy every week on ABC. There are very few absolutes in nature, 
the Everglades are supposed to be wet. And yet, sometimes in periods of drought, or when the waters are diverted for use in the cities and towns and farms close by, the struggle for survival becomes even more difficult. Then the wildlife must seek out the water that remains, and it's here that the alligator plays an important role in preserving the ecology of the region. During periods of dry weather, or whenever the water level is low, an alligator will find an existing hole or limestone depression that has retained some water in it. Then, by keeping the hole open and by enlarging it from day to day, the alligator's small personal pond soon becomes a refuge for fish, frogs, and turtles that would otherwise die during the dry season. With a ready supply of fish, the wading birds also come to the alligator hole. And so the balance of nature is precariously maintained until the water in the surrounding areas once more rises to more normal levels. Occasionally, of course, the alligator might eat one of the birds that comes to use his water hole. But in the meantime, he's unintentionally created the means by which dozens of others can survive. So too in the desert, a sudden or temporary change from the norm, in this case a temporary abundance of water in an otherwise arid region, can bring about even more dramatic changes in the life cycle. One of the best examples is the spadefoot toad, which survives very well in the desert, although like toads everywhere, it must be born in water and stay there until its gills become lungs and it develops legs for walking on dry land. With most toads of other areas, the process takes several months. With this desert toad, the entire cycle must take place much more quickly or the species would never have survived. It begins with a hard spring rain, which may last only a few minutes or a few hours. On the first night following the rain, when small pools of water have formed in the low spots of the desert, the adult spadefoots meet in one of the puddles. The females lay their eggs, the males shed their sperm, and if the puddles last for only two days, the eggs begin to hatch and hundreds of tiny tadpoles appear. Then, if the water should last for just another two weeks, the baby spadefoots are ready to live on dry land. Their gills have developed into lungs, their tails have disappeared, and their legs are ready for walking on the hard desert terrain. From that time on, practically the only moisture the toads get is from the insects they eat. They escape from the desert heat by digging burrows with their hind legs, which are equipped with tiny black spades, from which the toad gets its name. After the burrows are dug, the spade foot may lie motionless for hours at a time, avoiding the heat and conserving precious body moisture. The desert and the Everglades, two vastly different areas where life has adapted to climate, terrain, and the availability of other living things. It's all part of the exciting continuity of life which naturalists and conservationists are helping to preserve in the deserts of Arizona or right here in Everglades National Park. We'll be back in just a minute. Is that a wheel on? No, it's a rolling and turning thing I invented so I can ride and eat Kellogg's Cocoa Crispy cereal. Well, I know this vitamin fortified cereal tastes great with milk, but... Right, and Kellogg's Cocoa Krispies is especially fun to eat going down steep hills. It tastes like a chocolate milkshake, only crunchy. When I finish eating, I think I'll invent the break. I'm Tony the Tiger, and for years I've been saying Kellogg's Sugar Frosted Flakes are great. But I'll bet you don't even know what they're made of, do you? <laughs> well, it's this. The golden goodness of corn. 
Kellogg's takes it, flakes it, sweetens it with just the right amount of sugar, then fortifies it with eight vitamins. And the taste? Well, you tell them, little buddy. Oh, right on, Tiger. Brady. Mr. Brady, we'd like to do a research study of your typically American family. Yeah, look, I'm a little jammed up right now. At first, Mr. Brady was reluctant. But out. Uh, his wife, too, had reservations. No chance, man. And their housekeeper termed our idea... Hilarious. We observed moments of honest communication. Bloop, bloop, bloop. <laughs> their concern for proper discipline. Well, maybe we ought to hang them up and beat them. The play patterns of the children. We found warmth. Oh, I absolutely love you. And sympathy. I'm sorry, I, I'm really very sorry. <sighs> Burned onions. And concern for one another. <laughs> Our conclusion, the Brady Bunch is a very happy family. We hope you've enjoyed today's look at nature's adaptations in two distinctly different parts of the United States. Whether it's the watery world of the Everglades or the hot and arid world of the Arizona desert, there's an exciting variety of wildlife there for all of us to see and understand and enjoy. If you'd like to find out more about nature's adaptations and the science of ecology, ask your librarian for any of these books. Miraculous Web by Natalie Friendly. The Great Reaching Out, How Living Beings Communicate by Robert Froman. And Understanding Ecology by Elizabeth T. Billington. Be with us next week for another exciting discovery program. See you then. Bye-bye. The Discovery Unit's transportation and promotional consideration provided by United Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News. are young high school students from Pennsylvania, Vermont, New Jersey, and even as far away as Braunschweig, Germany. They've come together in the black ghetto area of South Boston to help rebuild a neighborhood. We'll see what happened to them and how they feel about this unusual project today when Discovery takes a first-hand look at One Summer in Boston. <laughs>